Well, hello and welcome to today's Bible reading and devotional time. This is Wednesday, uh, April 10th, 2024. Thank you for being here. And don't forget to hit that subscribe bar and then the notification bell when it comes up so you can be notified whenever content's added to the channel. And you know the drill to comment, like, share, that sort of thing. And this is day 10 now uh, of our reading. Now, I took a couple of days off to retool it. Uh, it was, we were going to do it in 30 days, and so I decided that, that to spread it out to 45. Uh, John chapter 3, the first uh, 20 verses that I did on Saturday it took a long time to uh, get the notes and everything put together to get it scripted and then to get it recorded and then edited and this is going to be more beneficial I think to do it this way so that we can maybe spend a little bit more time on some of these uh, deeper parts of John and uh, it'll it'll be more beneficial for us all let's just kind of leave it at that and all the way around it'll work so you want to get your Bibles and open to chapter 3. That's where we will get started. Now, some of this will be a repeat of what uh, we did on the Saturday uh, session, but there's some things that I have added as we break John. It was John chapter 3 was originally going to be in two parts. It's going to be, I think, in four now. So let's go ahead and read these first uh, nine verses that are really familiar to us all. And, of course, Tomorrow we'll get into verse 16. But there was a man named of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, and this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Okay. And, uh, oh, verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? I was going to cut that off and do it with tomorrow's, but this will sort of set the stage for tomorrow's reading that we will be doing then. So let's uh, take this apart a little bit and look at Nicodemus. Now, he's a Pharisee. Member of the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees would be considered the more conservative of the groups. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were the two main groups. Sadducees would have been considered the liberals, uh, not like are we those who call themselves progressive Christian. Well, maybe they would be because the, the the Sadducees only accepted the Pentateuch. That is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Or, scratch that. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, and to them, that was it. Uh, the Pentateuch, the books of Moses. That's all they accepted. They didn't accept anything after that. The other thing is they did not believe in angels, which is interesting because angels are mentioned, for instance, in Genesis 18 with the visitors that come to Abraham. I haven't really delved much into that as to why they reject angels. And second they reject um, the resurrection. And we'll see a question that they kept stumping the Pharisees with about the resurrection uh, later. So he's coming to Jesus, but he didn't come openly. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. And by the way, we don't know really much more than what we see in Scripture about Nicodemus. I don't think he's been mentioned in any archaeological discoveries or anything like that. But he comes to Jesus by night. And a couple of things to point out. There's, there's really a lot of things we learned from Nicodemus. But first off, we see the stages of his growth. First of all, he's uh, an anxious inquirer. Uh, a lot of the rich, a lot of the powerful, then and now, were afraid to confess faith in Jesus openly. And to have actually uh, convictions about Jesus being the Messiah. And so, Joe, or, um, so Nicodemus coming to him at night, 
and Joseph of Arimathea, who eventually would play out in the end uh, after the crucifixion by donating the burial plot for or the burial cave or whatever you want to call it for Jesus. He was also a secret disciple. He was afraid of the Jewish leaders and getting kicked out of the synagogue and that sort of thing. So he came to Jesus by night. And a second thing we see from here is he is a, he is a sincere believer, but he's still pretty weak. Uh, his spiritual history, look at uh, John 7, we'll see over there. In fact, uh, Nicodemus will be a couple of times will show up here in the Gospel of John. He is still going to uh, ask some pointed questions, John, John chapter 7. He's going to be a part of the discussion there. But he's not real bold, not like Peter on, on Pentecost. He's not, not anything like that. And finally, Nicodemus becomes a bold and a strong believer. In John chapter 19 and verse uh, 39... We'll, uh, you can see over here in this last section of chapter uh, 19 that uh, John says that Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes. So something clicked in his mind, something clicked in his heart that he settled on the question, or rather settled on the answer that Jesus is the Messiah. And now he's going to help prepare the body for burial, or at least he's got a respect and a love of Jesus that he's going to make sure he gets a proper burial. And so then, in uh, verse 2, if you want to look at that, where we're told he came uh, to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs unless God is with them. So it begs the question, why did he come at night? Why didn't he come during the daytime? Well, fear of criticism, for one thing. And you remember, he's a Sanhedrin. He's, he is, yes, a man of power, but he's just one of, of all the members and could be kicked out, could be ridiculed. A lot of people today are a sort of a Nicodemus mindset. They'll be a Christian, but they'll be secretly. I don't want to talk about it, you know, I can't, you know, I'm talking about it here in front of the guys, it's, uh, it's not, uh, oh, here they come, so just be quiet about it. That, that's fear of criticism, oh man, you're a Christian, don't tell me you're one of those. That keeps a lot of people from coming to Jesus. He had a desire for an uninterrupted conversation. Coming at night, the crowds have gone home for the evening, they're having their supper, they're... Uh, but once it got dark, it was hard to do any work anyway, so might as well go and head to the house. So now, okay, the crowds are thinned out. They're not around. He can go and have a conversation. And then maybe he wanted to make some sort of private investigation, get the facts before he made a public commitment. Nobody wants to make it. Well, some do want to make hasty decisions, I think about various things, clubs to join, trips to take, or whatever they're going to do. They make a hasty decision, and they say, whoa, wait a minute, why didn't I do that? Why didn't I take the time to think this through or ask questions? See, Nicodemus doesn't want to become a, or, yeah, I guess a follower of Christ, and then be embarrassed. The, and nobody wants that, so he's trying to avoid that. A couple other things to uh, consider couple of other things to consider how Nicodemus coming at night Nicodemus being on the Sanhedrin he's obviously a thinker probably a pretty deep thinker and so coming and sitting down with Jesus he's going to meet his intellectual equal or, or maybe even superior but there, he's going to be able to talk to Jesus and question him from the idea of someone who has learned not someone uh, who's uneducated and very bewildered more than anything else. And so he sees himself as representing also a significant number of Jews. And so uh, the, the Nicodemus sees himself that way. So he's got these questions, and who knows, maybe he's reporting back to somebody. We don't know that for sure, but I've sometimes wondered about that. 
or it could just be blatantly on his own. Okay, nobody's looking. Everybody's gone. I'm going to sneak away and talk to Jesus. And keep in mind, he does have a searching heart. And that is something we desperately need today are people who have got searching hearts and who are concerned about uh, spiritual matters. He's showing some humility in seeking out and admitting a personal need. Hey, I don't understand this. I don't understand who you are, what you're doing. So explain these things to me. And then having a perseverance in overcoming obstacles. That keeps a lot of people from finding Christ. Uh, they they start maybe reading the Bible a little bit, and then they, man, this is too tough. I think I'm just going to give it up. And, or, why would I want to go to church? There's all those hypocrites there. There's this there. There's that there. That should not stop you from going to church. Other people should not stop you from going to church. I see people, for instance, who don't like the same restaurants I do. It doesn't stop me. Oh, because my buddy here doesn't like um, McDonald's, let's just say, I can't go to McDonald's. No, I, I'm not going to let him uh, stop me just because of his opinion. I'm still going to go. Uh, third, insight in recognizing the gospel message relates to our, uh, to our lives. A searching heart's got to see that insight, or rather have that insight, and recognize the need of the gospel. If you've got a searching and you're really seeking the Lord, then the gospel, you, you need to see the gospel message still relates to our lives today, and then have a willingness to submit to the Lordship of Jesus. Ooh, that's a big one. I'm not having anybody tell me what to do, but if you're a Christian, that means you're submitting to his Lordship, in other words, to his superiority, that in plain English, he's the boss. And then obedience is going beyond mental assent. It is not just saying, yeah, I believe. Yeah, I know your denomination might have said, just believe, and uh, believe in your heart, and that's it, you're saved. Well, that's not what the Bible says. And we'll get into that uh, in other videos. But we've got to understand we have to go beyond just a simple uh, mental ascent uh, to an actual dependence on the Lord and on his promises. And then, of course, the big one. Being born again. How can a man be born when he's old? I don't know how old Nicodemus was. 40s, maybe. Maybe he was the same age as Jesus. Don't know, but with a different culture, different life expectancies, and that kind of thing. Uh, we, we don't know. That's really not that important. But the point is, I'm a grown man. How do I get back in my mother's womb and be born again? So he's thinking physical. Just like in the next chapter, when Jesus encounters the woman at the well, she's thinking physical water. She's thinking, you know, H2O, like I've got here uh, in this glass, uh, the stuff that we drink to keep our bodies hydra hydrated and to stay alive. But Jesus wants her to think spiritual. That's what he wants to do here with Nicodemus. Nicodemus, where, okay, I need, you're thinking earth, you need to think heavenly things in so many words. So what do we learn from this question that Nicodemus asks? Because we can sometimes learn things from questions and not just answers well a couple of things we can see here the prejudice leads men to misunderstand the plainest doctrines of religion our prejudices because uh, nicodemus is thinking in earthly terms that can get him um he'll miss the heavenly meaning that jesus wants him to have prejudice against jesus from the pharisees led them to misunderstand plain bible teaching from the old testament about the messiah our prejudices today will either lead us to misunderstand or even reject. Yeah, uh, I know that X, Y, or Z is a sin, but I have friends who do that. They're, they're really good people. And that's your prejudice of, uh, uh, kicking in. The Bible doesn't say that it's okay to do certain sins as long as you're a good person. That's not the criteria. The criteria is, what does the Word of God say? Uh, how do I become a Christian? There's a lot of prejudice against that because people have uh, moved away from what the uh, book of Acts tells us. And remember, our authority comes from this side of the cross. 
And so the prejudice there kicks in because, well, my church says I just have to pray the sinner's prayer. Okay, fine. Where's that in the Bible? It's not there. And then uh, the things which are at first difficult to understand or maybe even absurd, once they're explained, can become clear. So the you know, salvation, for instance. What is uh, the role of baptism in salvation or faith? To some people, that's a little bit cloudy, especially when you try to say, well, we're saved by grace, and then explain how baptism works. That's another discussion for another time. But the idea is that uh, once it's explained, it should be clear. Romans chapter 6 gives the clearest explanation, I think, of why we have to be immersed. And those who are high up on the social and the political and the corporate ladder uh, can be the most ignorant. And they can be the toughest to reach. Because I've got money, why do I need God? Or, yeah, I go to the whatever church when I want to, and I give a very large contribution. I'm very generous in what I give. And so they can be the ones that are hardest to get them to see their need. And then we also have to remember that a doctrine should not be rejected because the rich or the great do not believe it or do not understand it. You know, I cannot reject a, a particular doctrine just because the guy that I didn't like from high school believes it. It would study the doctrine and see what it is and whatever the doctrine is and see if it has any merit. There, there are people in the denominations that I know that are right on some things, believe it or not. And then the doctrine of regeneration, that is our salvation, is not false because Nicodemus didn't understand. Something is not, that was a double negative I almost used. A given doctrine is not going to be false because um, you don't believe it or because you don't like it. Uh, you hear the expression, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Well, that's incorrect. God said it, that settles it, period. Whether you believe it or not is immaterial. So that is, that was kind of long, a little bit rambling, but that's going to wrap it up for us today. So it's Wednesday, so we will go to God in prayer and pray for our community and our community leaders and our neighbors. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for getting us to this halfway point of the week. We thank you, Lord, for the things that you provide for all of us and want to pray for our community, pray for all of our towns, our neighbors, pray especially for our community leaders and help them to make uh, some godly choices Help them to keep their communities on a path of righteousness and help us as citizens, Lord, to be the righteous uh, part of our society and to help influence it, to have a revival, to bring souls to you. We pray, Lord, you'll guide us this day. Help us to make wise decisions as we go out. Help us, Lord, to make uh, good choices that would be glorifying to you and to have a ready answer should anyone ask us a reason for the hope that is in us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for all you do. In his name we pray. Amen. So if you have any questions, you can leave them in the comment section below along with your comments or send questions to me at uh, 2 Timothy 4.2.3 at gmail.com. That will wrap it up for today. We will see you in the next video. I'm done and I am out. I'm actually going to need a lot of coffee today.